Uh, welcome to the final presentation of the SSR Insights in Neuroendocrinology of Reproduction uh, webinar series. Uh, to date, we've had three excellent presentations. Uh, first one by Sue Mender was Mechanisms Regulating GnRH Neurons. Uh, the second one was Kiss Peptin Neurons and Circuits that Control Ovulation by uh, Richard Pie. And the third one was Novel Bidirectional bi Pathways and Hypothalamic Control of Reproduction and Metabolism by Victor Navarro. And all of those uh, presentations focused on rodents. Uh, today, the last presentation in the webinar series will be given by Rodolfo, Rodolfo Cardosa from Texas A&M University. Rodolfo comes to us from Brazil. He obtained a DVM and MS from Sao Paulo uh, State University and then moved to Texas A&M where he completed a PhD in physiology of reproduction in uh, 2014. Uh, Rodolfo extended his expertise in reproduction through a two-year stint as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan Medical Center. He then returned to Texas A&M to accept a position in the Department of Animal Sciences with a joint appointment in the Department of Veterinary Integrative Biosciences, where he currently serves as an assistant professor. Uh, he's been very successful in securing funding for his research from NIH and the USDA as well as receiving uh, support through uh, Texas A&M system. Having heard about uh, neuroendocrine reg regulation of rodents in the last three webinars, today we will switch gears a little and Dr. Cardoso will educate us about the me metabolic regulation of neuroendocrine system in ruminants. Uh, Rodolfo, it's all yours. Great, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Nat. It's, it's a great honor to be presenting this webinar. First, I'd like to thank you for for the introduction, I'm honored. I mean, I've always been a great follower of the great research that you've done in, in neuroendocrinology and sheep at Colorado State. I'd also like to thank uh, Pete Hansen and Dan Bernard for the invitation to, to present this webinar. So as, uh, as Terry mentioned, uh, I'll be talking today about the metabolic regulation of the neuroendocrine system. And we focus primarily in cattle. Uh, I, use, I use sheep and cattle as animal models in my program, but uh, because of the limited time here, I'll focus on, on the nutritional programming of puberty in cattle uh, with some, drawing some parallels with the sheep model whenever possible. So as a presentation uh, outline, what I aim to talk today is again, the relevance of timing of puberty to livestock animals as well as humans. So I think uh, uh, we've been successful as, uh, uh, as securing funding using ruminants uh, as an animal model for biomedical research and hopefully uh, I'll be able to demonstrate some of the benefits of using sheep and cattle as a model for, for biomedical research and how this information that we learn from these animals can be relevant to, uh, to human uh, reproduction. I'll talk about the neuroendocrine control puberty in female ruminants, so how that's regulated, particularly in cattle. Uh, and then I will shift and talk about, again, nutrition strategies and the impact of nutrition and metabolism on puberty heifers. And I'll focus on two key systems that we have studied. Uh, so the first system is the neuropeptide Y or NPY GnRH system, as well as the proper melanocortin or POMC kispeptin system. And, and obviously, this has been discussed in the previous webinars, particularly by the presentation from, from Victor Navarro. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the interaction. This is some of the most current research we're doing, uh, not only looking at the nutritional programming postnatally, but also the interaction of prenatal nutrition. So the nutrition of the dam during gestation, how that impacts uh, the development of the brain and pubertal programming in the female offspring. So just a quick uh, introduction about the relevance. Again, uh, I think most of you must be familiar with the relevance to human reproductive health, but obviously this is a very important topic in livestock production. So time of onset of puberty is extremely important for reproductive efficiency and overall performance of animals. Uh, this applies to different species, small ruminants, but particularly to cattle and, and in the region where I am located in the south of Texas and, and all southern states of U.S., the predominant breed of cattle uh, in this area are animals that are more adapted to these tropical and subtropical environments. But one of the drawbacks of these animals is they tend to reach puberty quite late. So even though they have, a lot of times they have the, the, the 
the size and, and, and the body weight that is adequate to support a healthy, safe pregnancy, a lot of times uh, these females will take quite a bit to reach puberty and be able to reproduce. So there are a lot of interest in developing strategies to advance puberty uh, in some of these animals. That are not only is important for time of set of puberty, but also this integration of the metabolic system with reproduction, particularly at the brain level, plays a really important role on the duration of the postpartum on asterisk. So we know that an adequate uh, energy reserves, adequate uh, metabolic status will advance cyclicity. And these animals will be able to reestablish cyclicity after, uh, uh, after the parturition and reestablish uh, reproductive cycles faster if, if uh, nutritional conditions are adequate. And obviously that will have an overall impact on fertility of these animals. Again, from a human reproductive standpoint, there's quite a bit of evidence showing that childhood obesity is associated with precocious puberty in girls. And obviously in girls that is associated with several adverse uh, health outcomes that increases the risk of uh, metabolic disease, that increase the risks of some of reproductive cancers, increase the risk of polycystic ovary syndrome. So obviously in human medicine, there is a lot of interest in trying to understand the mechanisms by which obesity drives precocious pu puberty and try to develop strategies to prevent that. Not only that it has an impact on puberty, but we know that metabolic uh, disorders, particularly uh, insulin resistance associated with programming several adverse health outcomes, impacts overall fertility, and can also lead to the development or increased manifestation of some uh, reproductive disorders, such as polycystic ovary syndrome. So again, this integration of, of metabolism and, and reproductive function, particularly at the neuroendocrine level, is really important for overall performance and fertility in animals and humans. Now, as Dr. Nan mentioned, I, uh, we're using a little bit different model from the three previous speakers. So we're using uh, ruminants as a model. This is a slide uh, that was actually created by my postdoc advisor, Vasanta Padmanabhan at University of Michigan. Here she's comparing some key aspects of development during fetal life between sheep and humans. And we can see that there's a nice parallelism between some key aspects of organogenesis during fetal development between ruminants and humans. And th th this parallel becomes even stronger when we talk about cattle where the gestation is roughly 40 weeks. So quite similar to what we see in women. So again, the developmental trajectory in ruminants is, is uh, is much more similar to what we see in humans if you compare with some rodent models where a lot of the, the prenatal development that happens in humans actually occurs postnatally in rodents. Another major benefit of large animal models is allow for rep repetitive blood collection for post-characterization. So I'll be talking about GNR agent and late secretion. So obviously, as you probably are aware, those are hormones that are secreted in a pulsatile manner so to really characterize the pattern of secretion of those hormones, it's very important to be able to collect repetitive serial blood collection for a long period of time to be able to identify changes in the pattern of secretion of those hormones. So again, I think uh, Sumantra has shown uh, a really good model uh, where she uses uh, electrophysiology to be able to characterize the polarization of GnRH neurons and obviously that is used as a great marker for secretion of GnRH. But one of the great ability of ruminants is also availability of surgical procedures to detect the GnRH release. So uh, this technique has been developed by several laboratories in France, uh, Michigan, and, and, and as well as uh, in Australia, where uh, we've been able to successfully collect blood from the portal uh, collect blood from the portal vasculature that connects the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, and that allows to detect generate secretion again in the, in the hypothalamic pituitary portal vasculature. Another approach is also collecting cerebrospinal fluid from the third ventricle. And again, in the cerebrospinal fluid, we can use that. Uh, we can detect generate pulse, generate secretion in the cerebrospinal fluid and use that as a marker for, again, for activation and polarization of generating neurons. So, uh, that's one of the major benefits, again, of using the sheep or cattle as a model for detecting generation release. Another major benefit is, again, these animals allow for no invasive monitoring of ovarian follicular dynamics. So we can transrectally ultrasound 
their ovaries and measure follicular growth, determine size of dominant follicle, determine size of any ovarian structure. So obviously that's another major benefit of these uh, this models. And finally, uh, important to remember that those animals are kept in a natural setting throughout those studies and before the studies. So that prevents any stress that can be caused by ca uh, caging of those animals or handling those animals. So again, that's, uh, uh, that's a quite similar to what would be a natural setting for those animals. Just a quick, quick overview, particularly for those that were not in the previous uh, webinars. Again, obviously, the hypothalamus is responsible for production and secretion of this decapeptide hormone, um, termed GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. This is producing really small amounts and through a special vasculature that connects the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, uh, um, referred to as the, the, the portal vasculature, the hypothalamus pituitary portal vasculature. This decapeptide reaches the anterior pituitary and then in the anterior pituitary stimulates gonadotropes to secrete luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Those are larger glycoprotein hormones that can travel through the purpure circulation. And then obviously in the case of the female can stimulate the ovaries, can stimulate steroidogenesis in the ovary, as well as stimulate uh, development of follicles and, and ovulation and formation of CL. Very importantly, not only we see this main axis of the HPG axis, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, but there's some really important feedback regulatory mechanisms, particularly by estradiol and progesterone, which are secreted by the ovary. And again, will feed back and to some extent, uh, or to a large extent, regulate generate secretion, and to a smaller extent, regulate directly uh, function of the anterior pituitary, regulating a late and FSH secretion. So obviously, these feedback regulatory mechanisms are extremely important in regulating age of puberty, regulating ovulation, cyclicity and overall fertility in basically all female mammals. Obviously, in my lab, uh, we study, we have concerns about environmental exposures. I won't be talking about that data today, but obviously we, are we have concerns about chemicals, endocrine disrupting chemicals that uh, have some affinity to steroid receptors, particularly the estrogen receptor, and can obviously disrupt the regulation of the HPG axis. So BPA is one of those that has one of those chemicals that has estrogenic activity can impair this very tightly regulated feedback regulatory mechanism. But again, what I'll be talking today is the interaction of nutrition and metabolic status regulating function of the neuroendocrine axis. So that's extremely important. And, and I think one of the major breakthroughs in the, the understanding of this nutrition and metabolic regulation of the neuroendocrine axis was with the discovery of leptin. So leptin was discovered in 1994. And here we see a mouse that has a mutation in the OB gene. So the OB gene is the gene that encodes for leptin. So these animals have a loss of function mutation in the OB gene. So as you can see, compared to litter mates, those animals are obese, they are hyperphagic. Uh, but from a reproductive standpoint, uh, these animals are also infertile. So those animals never reach puberty and can never reproduce uh, clearly showing that leptin is not only an important uh, uh, metabolic factor that is produced by the adipose tissue that travels to, to the brain and regulates satiety and feed intake and energy homeostasis in the brain, but also is a very important peripheral factor that will regulate secretion of the GnRH. And that's clear because when we give exogenous leptin to these animals that have this loss of function mutation, these animals will reestablish cyclicity, will reach puberty, and be able to reproduce. So demonstrating that uh, leptin is one of those key factors that will signal energy reserve and energy status to the brain. And by doing that, we'll regulate uh, a secretion of GnRH. But more importantly, so what I've talked so far are the activation effects of leptin, right? So whenever uh, adiposity increases, the adipose tissue produces more leptin and leptin will signal that to the brain and it will uh, indirectly regulate secretion of GnRH. But more important than the activation effects are really the organizational effects that leptin can have during early development. So this is a paper that was published in 2004 by uh, Sebastian Bure, showing that leptin is really important. So this region of the brain uh, that we can see in this uh, in vitro study, this is the arcuate nucleus. So the arcuate nucleus is a region in the hypothalamus it is one of the key regions uh, that is sensing uh, metabolic status. It's where uh, 
majority of the neurons that express leptin receptor and, and insulin receptor are present in the brain. And we can see that in the presence or absence of leptin, uh, that will lead to major changes in the synaptic connection and formation of synaptic pathways within the arcuate nucleus. So they demonstrated that in the OB mouse that doesn't have leptin during key periods of development, there's a major change in the plasticity of the arcuate nucleus and formation of those synaptic connections. And they also shown in vitro that in the presence of leptin, that will stimulate neurid outgrowth and it will stimulate formation of synaptic connections within the arcuate nucleus. And whenever leptin is not present, obviously we see a dramatic difference in the formation of those synaptic pathways uh, from the arcuate nucleus to other brain regions. So that clearly demonstrates that not only leptin has these activation effects, but again, even more importantly, leptin during key periods of brain development, development will modulate the plasticity of the brain and modulate and the formation of some of these synaptic connections. And it's important to emphasize that those changes are permanent. Those are lifelong uh, changes in the, in the plasticity of the, the hypothalamus that will persist with the life of those animals. So again, there's a lot of concerns about uh, changes in conditions that will lead to changes in circulating concentrations of leptin, particularly obesity, not only during postnatal life, but also during gestation, how that can impact the development of those brain regions and have, again, long-term effects obviously uh, in energy and homeostasis of those individuals, but also from a reproductive standpoint. Again, and a clear example where we see that is in the, in the process of masculinization of the brain. So we know that, for instance, uh, androgens produced by, by the testes during fetal development will masculinize a, a region of the brain. So this is the anteroventral periventricular nucleus in rodents. And this is one of the most sexually dimorphic regions in the brain. And, and we know that androgen exposure during key periods of brain development will suppress. So what we see here is an in situ hybridization for estrogen receptor alpha in the brain. And we can clearly see that whenever that exposure occurs during fetal life, in adult life, we see a drastic reduction in the expression of ER alpha in this sexually dimorphic region in the brain. And that's important because we know that these neurons that express ER alpha are really important neurons uh, involved in the surge release of GnRH that will induce ovulation. So that explains why, obviously, the male in most species is incapable of inducing a pre-ovulatory GnRH surge uh, that would induce ovulation. So again, concerns are that exposure to chemicals that will have some estrogenic activity during fetal life will drive, to some extent, masculinization of the female brain to a more male-like brain. And obviously, that can impact the ability of those females to produce a pre-ovulatory surge release of January. So this is demonstrating that even though uh, steroid hormones and leptin play a really important activation effect, it's very important to keep in mind that if changes in the balance of steroid hormones or metabolic hormones during key periods of brain development, those can have permanent effects, organization effects on the development of the brain. And obviously that can have functional implications on the reproductive performance of those individuals. So this is a nice uh, schematic that was developed by uh, Mike Day while he was at Ohio State, showing some of the physiological and endocrine changes that occur during pubertal transition in heifers. So uh, clearly demonstrating that during, so typically a heifer, a female and cattle will reach puberty around 12 to 14 months of age. And what this diagram shows is, again, gradually as these animals are transitioning from a pre-pubertal towards a pubertal state, uh, the brain becomes less responsive to the estradiol negative feedback. So estradiol is suppressing uh, GnRH and LH secretion. So that leads to a low frequency of GnRH and LH secretion pulses. And obviously that doesn't provide gonadotropic support for development of large dominant follicles. However, gradually, as these animals are going through a transition period that typically lasts about two months before puberty, these animals will gradually show a decrease in the, the responsiveness to this estradiol negative feedback, and that will allow for an increase in the tonic secretion of GnRH. So we increase pulse frequency of GnRH pulses, and obviously that will increase the pulse frequency of LH uh, secretion, and obviously that will start stimulating, uh, that will provide gonadotropic support and stimulate uh, development, the final stages of development of a dominant follicle. 
Eventually, the abdominal follicle produces enough estradiol to reach a threshold to activate the estradiol positive feedback, and that will obviously drive the first ovulation, which characterizes puberty uh, in these animals. But important to mention is really this tonic increase in GnRH secretion. This increase from a low frequency of GnRH pulses towards a high frequency of GnRH pulses is the limiting factor that really determine when a heifer reaches puberty. And that's clearly demonstrated by quite a bit of work that's been done in sheep previously. I think uh, uh, Doug Foster, University of Michigan, has generated a lot of data clearly showing that uh, uh, the system, uh, the, the activation of the astrodial positive feedback, that system is already developed and mature way before those animals reach puberty. So that ability of the brain to activate the astrodial positive feedback given exogenously is present before puberty occurs and is really not a limiting factor. We also know that the ability of the pituitary to respond to GnRH is also present before puberty occurs, and obviously the ability of the follicle to ovulate uh, is also uh, uh, is also present uh, much before puberty occurs. So really, they're demonstrating this that this tonic increase in GnRH secretion is the limiting factor, and is the factor that determines when uh, those animals will attain puberty. And again, the idea with the nutritional programming, and again, this is one of the few, if not the only slides that, that is a little bit more focused on livestock production, but here are different breeds of cattle. And again, one of the key goals in livestock production, particularly in the cattle industry, is to be able to breed uh, those heifers for the first time, roughly at 14 months of age. And we know that for some breeds uh, that, so this is the natural distribution of the normal distribution of puberty for different breeds of cattle. And we know for some breeds, again, as we see in other species that are important uh, genotypic or important genetic influence on age of puberty. And for some, pu some, some different breeds, those animals will reach puberty before this target first breeding at 14 months of age. But with a lot of breeds, particularly those breeds found in tropical and subtropical regions, those animals will reach puberty naturally much later than the target uh, start of the first breeding season. So there's a lot of interest in trying to develop strategies, particularly nutritional strategies, to be able to shift this normal distribution of age of puberty to the left. And that's what we've done quite a bit of work, again, particularly working with what we refer to Bosindicus influence breeds, breeds that have some Brahmin influence, where again, spontaneously, those heifers would reach puberty much later than 14 months of age, even though at this point, they already have the skeletal size that would be required to support a healthy, safe pregnancy. So again, the concept of the goal with nutritional programming shifts this curve of, of distribution of age of puberty to the left and be able to accomplish this important goal of breeding them at approximately 14 months of age. And again, we've done quite a bit of work, and this was work done uh, in our group here even before I joined by, by Dr. Gary Williams and Marcel Mstalden. And obviously, this has been done in other, by other groups as well, clearly showing that if we win heifers early at approximately four months of age and promote a high rate of body weight gain, which in this example is, again, promoting a rate of roughly one kilogram per day or two pounds per day, we can advance age of puberty in those animals considerably compared to animals that are winning at exactly the same age, but go through this period gaining body weight at a much lower rate of roughly 0.5 kilograms per day or one pound per day. And we've done extensive characterization of the hormonal profile in these animals. We know that promoting this higher rate of body weight gain results in higher uh, circulating levels of leptin in those animals, as well as insulin, IGF-1, so there's major uh, endocrine changes and metabolic changes in these animals uh, that go through this higher rate uh, of body weight gain. And again, that will result in a considerable increase or advancement in puberty in those animals compared to heifers that are gaining only 0.5 kilograms per day. So obviously what the data will be showing now is trying to understand the mechanisms and try to understand how this increase of body weight gain and increase of adiposity can advance puberty in those animals. So obviously our hypothesis is that increased adiposity, particularly associated with increased circulating concentrations of leptin, will lead to structure and functional changes in GnRH afferent pathways. So these are the pathways that are upstream to GnRH neurons. 
One important uh, side note here to emphasize is, again, even though steroid hormones and metabolic hormones play a really important role regulating GnRH secretion, it's important to, to emphasize that GnRH neurons are not impacted directly by leptin. For instance, they do not express, do not contain the leptin receptor. GnRH neurons also don't contain the estrogen receptor alpha or ESR1, showing that, you know, the, the, the the ways by which steroid hormones and, and metabolic hormones regulate secretion of GnRH is indirectly by acting in an upstream network of neurons that do express the receptor, for instance, for leptin and insulin, and project and form the synaptic connections and have either excitatory or inhibitory effects on GnRH secretion. So two of those pathways that we'll be discussing today are the NEPY and the POMC pathways. So NEPY or neuropeptide Y is a major inhibitory neuropeptide that suppresses GnRH uh, secretion in ruminants, and NEPY uh, is suppressed by higher levels of leptin. So NEPY is one of the key neuropeptides regulating appetite. So when leptin levels are high, that suppresses NEPY, and again, by suppressing NEPY, that activates the satiety centers in the brain and, and suppresses uh, uh, feed intake and appetite. Uh, from a reproductive standpoint, again, increased levels of adiposity has been uh, uh, demonstrated to inhibit NEPY expression in the ARPA nucleus. And again, by inhibiting a neurotransmitter that has inhibitory effects, uh, that will result in increased secretion of GnRH. And the other pathway that I'll be talking about is the POMC or the proper melanocortin pathway, which in this case has excitatory effects. Uh, particularly through acting through the alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. So the POMC gene can be cleaved in several different products, but one of the key products of the POMC gene is, again, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone or alpha MSH. And alpha MSH has been shown to stimulate secretion of GnRH in ruminants. So again, we postulate that increasing leptin will suppress this inhibitory uh, uh, peptide and stimulate uh, POMC, particularly stimulating alpha MSH and by that, uh, we'll have an increased secretion, tonic secretion of GnRH. So again, we are back using uh, that model that I mentioned before uh, of the high gain and low gain heifers. Again, the high gain heifers, as a reminder, are the animals gaining body weight at a higher rate. Those are the animals with higher levels of leptin, insulin, and IGF-1. And we collected the brain from those animals before they attained puberty. Again, uh, roughly at eight months of age after that period, the four month period of uh, nutritional treatment. We had shown previously, our group uh, by Dr. Gary Williams has shown previously the NEPY indeed has inhibitory effects on GnRH and LH release in ruminants and cattle. So here we have seen given exogenous uh, uh, saline and given exogenous NEPY. We can see that animals that receive NEPY had a suppressed, a major suppression in pulsatile release of luteinizing hormone in the peripheral circulation, as well as GnRH secretion in the third ventricle, in the cerebrospinal fluid collected from the third ventricle, showing that those effects of NEPY are mediated largely at the hypothalamic level. So again, when we collected the brain from those heifers before they attained puberty, again, we have three different subregions of the ARCA nucleus. Again, the ARCA nucleus is where majority of those neurons that express leptin receptor are present. And we can see that promoting a higher rate of body weight gain in the black bar results in a decrease a number of uh, NEPY expressing neurons within the ARPA nucleus. So we can see here some images by uh, in situ uh, hybridization showing a lot of neurons that express NEPY, and particularly in the middle region of the ARPA, we see a suppression in the number of those neurons expressing NEPY. Not only the total number of NEPY neurons is reduced in those animals, but when we look at the overall density uh, or expression on a per neuron basis, again, looking at density of the signal, we see that within the three sub areas of the arc and nucleus, there's also a reduction in, in the overall expression of NPY, showing again that a high rate of body weight gain decreases the overall number of NPY expressing neurons and the abundance of the, the NPY messenger RNA within uh, each of those neurons. From a plasticity standpoint, we also look at projections of those NPY inhibitory inputs towards GnRH neurons. So we postulated that again, changes in leptin will change synaptic formation during those key periods of brain development. 
and that can change plasticity of those inhibitory inputs. And what we found is, again, with the high gain animals, there is a lower percentage of GnRH neurons that express, uh, that they have received inputs that are in close opposition to NPY fibers in the preoptic area of the brain, as well as in the medial basal hypothalamus. And again, this is another difference compared to rodent models, uh, a little bit more similar to what we see in humans and, and, and non-human primates, in cattle and, and ruminants overall, generation neurons migrate more calmly, and not only we have an important population of generation neurons in the preoptic area, but again, similar to humans, we also see a large population of generation neurons that migrate more calmly to the middle basal hypothalamus. And we see that uh, the decreased percentage of neurons receiving any PY input uh, is, um, this reduction is more moderate in the preoptic area and more drastic, particularly in the medial basal hypothalamus. And again, when we look at number of close contacts or number of inputs per generation neurons, we see a significant reduction in the medial basal hypothalamus. And again, when we classify those neurons as highly innervated by NPY fibers, we also see a reduction, particularly in the medial basal hypothalamus. So showing that not only there are transcri transcriptional changes in the NPY gene, but also uh, uh, morphological changes in, in, the, in the plasticity of the system and, and the number of NPY inputs that project towards uh, GnRH neurons. Uh, again, in cattle and, and in ruminants overall, we have the ability to cannulate the third ventricle. So the third ventricle is the, the compartment that has cerebrospinal fluid right in between the two sides of the hypothalamus. Uh, this is showing where the, the cannula is placed. And, and again, this is a post surgery x ray showing the place of the cannula. And that allows us to collect again cerebrospinal fluid uh, directly from uh, the third ventricle and allow us to measure secretion of GnRH, but also measure secretion of any, uh, any neuropeptide uh, that is producing the hypothalamus. And that's mainly because of leakage of some of those neuropeptides close to the mid anaminase. And that allows us to actually detect some of those neuropeptides within the CSF. And again, this is showing that, as you would expect, as animals approach puberty, there is an increase in the tonic secretion of not only luteinizing hormone in the peripheral circulation, but also um, uh, GnRH in cerebrospinal fluid. But what we see again is that, obviously, as we would expect, the high gain heifers, the heifers that are approaching puberty, will have a higher pulse frequency of. of uh, luteinizing hormone and GnRH compared to the low-gain heifers, the ones that are not yet on that transition period. Those are heifers that would probably reach puberty around 14, 15, 16 months of age. So you can see that they are in a more deeper state of uh, peripubertal, uh, the peripubertal period. And we can clearly see that these animals in the high-gain group are already approaching that transition period where the pulse frequency increases uh, considerably compared to the low-gain and we see that in those animals, again, they also have a reduction, particularly as they approach puberty, we see a re reduction in the concentrations of neuropeptide Y in the third ventricle uh, cerebrospinal fluid. So again, with the NPY story, we see a reduction in the gene expression of NPY, we see a reduction in the concentration of NPY in the third ventricle uh, cerebrospinal fluid. But more importantly, we see changes in the number of NPY inputs towards GnRH neurons, explaining uh, to some extent why there is less inhibitory input on the, on the secretion of GnRH in the high gain heifer. Okay, so the other pathway that we look at is the proper melanocortin pathway or the POMC pathway. One important aspect of the POMC pathway, and I'll show the data in a minute here, but uh, even though it's been postulated that POMC, particularly through alpha message, could directly regulate function of GnRH neurons, I'm going to show some of our data and some data from rodents that also postulate or propose that kispeptin or candy neurons in the arc and uh, nucleus are important intermediate pathways that, uh, that mediate those effects, those stimulatory effects of the POMC neurons on GnRH secretion. So just as a quick introduction, again, kispeptin is a neuropeptide that's been discussed quite a bit in the three previous webinars. Uh, Kispeptin is the most potent stimulator of GnRH secretion ever discovered. And this population of neurons in the arc nucleus that express kispeptin, those are neurons termed candy neurons. Uh, 
because they co they're not only express dyspeptin, but they co-express um, dyspeptin, neurokinin B, and dimorphin. So again, uh, Victor Navarro and, and uh, presented and talked quite a bit of this last week, and obviously work done by Mike Lehman and Bob Goodman have done a really good job demonstrating the role of these candy neurons on the tonic and, and also the surge release of GnR8. So it's been postulated that some of those stimulatory effects are not by direct input of alpha message on GnRH neurons, but actually by stimulating function of these dyspeptin neurons, these candy neurons. And then obviously we know that these candy neurons have a really important role in stimulating GnRH secretion, particularly uh, the pulsatile tonic secretion. So here we perform some uh, in situ hybridization to look at abundance of the POMC uh, messenger RNA in the arcanucleus. And we saw that throughout the th three subregions of the arcanucleus, there is an upregulation of the POMC gene, a higher number of cells as well as a higher number of density uh, of signal per cell within those three subregions, showing that uh, this, again, high gain diet promotes or increases the expression of the POMC gene. Again, because of the POMC uh, uh, polypeptide can be cleaved in several different products, we also perform uh, immunohistochemistry procedures now specifically looking at alpha MSH uh, uh, abundance in the arcanucleus. And we see that not only the, the number of neurons expressing the POMC genes increase, but that translates also to a higher number of neurons. Uh, they're immunopositive for alpha message, showing that that increase in the POMC gene is also associated with an increase in abundance of the alpha message product. Next, we'll look at alpha message projections to GnRH neurons. And two important points that we learned with these studies. First, that there's no, there doesn't seem to be any effects of treatment on the number of inputs of alpha message to GnRH neurons. But I think the most important uh, message or most important uh, outcome that we learned from this study is that a really small, at least in cattle, a really small percentage of GnRH neurons, particularly in the preoptic area, receive some input from alpha message coming from the arcanucleus. So showing that uh, it's very unlikely that this direct pathway of alpha message towards GnRH neuron is one of the key mechanisms by which the melanocortin system stimulates uh, GnRH secretion in ruminants. Because again, roughly only 15 to 20 percent of GnRH neurons receive some uh, some input or in close contact with um, alpha message containing fiber. However, when we look at those candy neurons in the arcanucleus, those and we use kispeptin as a marker for those neurons. We see first that a much higher number of those neurons actually receive some input from uh, they're in close contact with alpha message fibers, but more importantly, there is also some plasticity in the system where the high gain heifers have a higher percentage of those neurons, particularly in the rostral and middle arcing nucleus. Uh, they are in close contact with uh, the, those candy neurons. They're in close contact with those alpha message fibers. So again seems like this pathway is much more important mediating some of those effects because a higher number of those neurons are receiving input. And again, nutritional status during development will change the number and the percentage of those neurons that actually receive those inputs. And again, this is supported by uh, rodent data. This is the only slide I have in rodents. Uh, and this was a really nice study uh, published a little bit after uh, we published our data that supports this idea showing again that kispeptin neurons in the arc are in close opposition with alpha message fibers. But more importantly, what we see here in this study is showing that uh, treating those animals with an antagonist of the melanocortin receptor uh, centrally causes a major down regulation of kispeptin expression within the arc and nucleus. So this is the rostral population of kispeptin neurons these are not, um, uh, or at least there's not enough evidence suggesting that these are directly regulated by the melanocortin system and the metabolic status. But again, when we look at the arcanucleus, we see that by treating these animals with a melanocortin uh, receptor three and four antagonist causes a major suppression of the total number of cells that are expressing kispeptin. So this was done in rats. And then when they use a mouse model, they show, so this is a mouse model that has a loss of function mutation, has a knockout of the kispeptin receptor or the GPR54. 
And we can see that when these animals are treated with an agonist of the melanoportin receptor, there is an increased LH secretion in response to that, showing again the stimulatory effects of the melanoportin system. However, when the same experiment was performed in animals that have this knockout of the expectant receptor, we see a major suppression in the ability of these animals to respond to this melanoportin uh, receptor agonist. So clearly demonstrating the expectant signaling is a major uh, mediator for these stimulatory effects of alpha message on a late secretion rodent. So supporting our our hypothesis that, again, this connection between alpha message and candy neurons is really important for uh, uh, maturation of the neuroendocrine system and stimulating puberty development efforts. Okay, so just as a, a quick summary for uh, our hypothesis and our model for this uh, puberty maturation of the neuroendocrine axis, again, in prepubertal heifers, heifers that don't have, uh, still don't have adequate uh, deposity and, and high levels of high concentrations of leptin in the peripheral circulation. We see that those animals have a higher uh, tonus of this inhibitory input. So they have higher expression of the NEPY messenger RNA. They have quite a bit of uh, NEPY inhibitory inputs, particularly directly on GNRH neurons. And they have less of the excitatory inputs of alpha message on candy neurons. So obviously, uh, again, this balance of higher inhibitory input and lower excitatory input results in a low frequency of GNRH pulses, uh, which obviously doesn't provide enough gonadotropic support for, for follicular development. However, when we uh, promote a higher rate of body weight gain and promote, promote adiposity, again, we lead to several endocrine changes in these animals. Uh, obviously, leptin is one of those key factors. Uh, important to mention that our model doesn't allow us to specifically determine whether that's only mediated by leptin. Obviously, these animals also have higher levels of insulin and IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1, and those are also important hormones acting in the brain and acting in the arc nucleus. But again, obviously, uh, research in the rodents really support the idea that leptin is one of those key players, and, and again, increased leptin will suppress some of those inhibitory inputs of NEPY by suppressing transcription of NEPY and suppressing uh, a change in the plasticity and, and input of the NEPY on GNRH neurons. It will also stimulate uh, the excitatory inputs of alpha message on candy neurons. And we know that that will have a major stimulatory effect on GNRH secretion. So again, the shifting balance of less inhibitory inputs and more excitatory inputs uh, on GNRH neurons and candy neurons will result in a higher frequency of uh, GNRH secretion, which obviously is, again, the limiting factor that will dictate when those heifers reach puberty. So again, we, we, we believe that those systems work together in combination, and both are extremely important. But again, with NPY, uh, evidence suggesting the NPY acting directly on GNRH neurons, where POMC neurons uh, will act primarily by stimulating uh, candy neurons in the arcanucleus, which again will, will have excitatory effects on GNRH release. Okay, so for the last uh, few minutes, I'll go over some of our most recent data and published data looking at the concept of prenatal programming. So obviously, all those studies that have shown so far show the effects of nutrition early during postnatal life, but we know that some of those systems and development of the arcanucleus and the hypothalamus starts during prenatal life. So obviously, with the idea of uh, uh, fetal programming and developmental origins of health and disease, we postulated that nutrition of the dams, nutrition of the cows during gestation could also impact brain development of the female offspring and could have a major impact on puberty attainment in those animals. So here is our approach and experimental design. So we focus nutrition during the last two trimesters of gestation. So those animals were inseminated, they were determined pregnant. We were able with ultrasound to determine the gender of the offspring. So obviously we only focus on female offspring. And then we started the nutritional treatment during the last two trimesters. And we basically had three group of cows. We had animals that were in moderate body condition score. So these are our control animals. And then we have, uh, so the, the body condition score uh, is classified on a scale from one to nine. The body condition score three, these are animals that are extremely thin during gestation. So this is our low body condition score. Uh, 
where we restricted feed intake of those animals. And we also had a third group of the animals that developed obesity during gestation. So these cows had a body condition score of 7.5 to 8, on, again, on a scale from 1 to 9. And these animals had ad libitum intake of uh, uh, grass, hay, and a high concentrate diet. And this clearly shows that, again, we are able to create quite a bit of contrast on their body condition score during the last two trimesters of gestation, and also create quite a bit of contrast on their body weight. Uh, I won't show here the data, but we characterize leptin uh, and metabolic hormones during gestation in these animals. And, and as, as you would expect, uh, the high gain animals that, that the cows are in, uh, obese during gestation had much higher levels of leptin compared to the moderate group and the low group. When uh, the heifer offspring, when the calves were born, again, those animals were divided into two groups. So that really creates a three by two factorial design. So those heifers were uh, weaned at four months of age and fed either a low gain diet or a high gain diet to gain one kilogram per day. And this is exactly, the postnatal aspect is exactly the same as from the data I presented in the previous slides. So again, this creates a three by two factorial with three different levels of nutrition during the two last trimesters of gestation and two different levels of nutrition postnatally, again, creating three, uh, six different groups. And I refer the first letter of those groups refers to the maternal nutrition and the second letter refers to the postnatal nutrition. So we have the high, 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 low, mid high, mid low, and obviously low high and low low. And I'm here showing again uh, that we are able to successfully create a nice contrast in body weight of those heifers. And again, similar to what we see in the other studies, we also see contrast in the circulating levels of leptin with the high gain heifers having higher uh, circulating concentrations of leptin. Uh, one of the key aspects that we saw, again, is birth weight of those animals. We saw that with the animals that were restricted pre prenatally, we saw a reduction in their body weight compared to the high gain animals, uh, with obviously the moderate animals having uh, intermediate body weight at birth. So showing that extreme uh, nutrient restriction during the station during the last two trimesters results in a moderate uh, intrauterine growth restriction uh, in those uh, female offspring. Next, we monitor that offspring and determine age of puberty by assessing uh, elevations in concentration of progesterone. And, and against our hypothesis, we, we didn't observe any maternal or, or uh, maternal effect or maternal and postnatal interaction. So as we have seen before, obviously the high gain heifers postnatally had a major advancement in puberty. So uh, promoting high rates of body weight gain after weaning resulted in roughly an approximately two month anticipation in age of puberty compared to the low gain heifers. But again, when we look at the facts of prenatal nutrition, we didn't see any impact on the age of puberty of those animals or any interaction with postnatal nutrition. After those animals achieve puberty, we overectomized them and, and replaced them with estradiol to have them in a similar uh, steroidal uh, hormone profile. And we've done a quite extensive characterization of the reproductive phenotype on these animals. And here I'm just summarizing that basically we haven't seen any key difference, any major differences in, in, in all the reproductive phenotype or reproductive endpoints that we investigated. So there are no differences in the pre-evolutory follicle size, follicular growth rate, uh, CL size, expression of asterisk, asterisk cycle length, concentrations of progesterone during the luteal phase or concentrations of estradiol during the follicular phase. We also extensively characterize uh, the tonic secretion of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone in those animals. And again, we don't see, we didn't observe any significant effects of the prenatal treatment on the tonic secretion of those hormones. Next, we we, try, we postulated that perhaps there were no changes in the tonic secretion, but then we treated those animals with uh, estradiol to determine, to assess the negative and positive feedback response to pharmacological uh, levels of estradiol in these animals, particularly, again, to, act, to determine whether the responsiveness of the scanty neurons to exogenous estradiol would be impairing those animals. And again, similar to what we've seen in the previous data, we saw during the estradiol negative feedback, we saw suppression in the late secretion of those animals, but again, 
without any treatment effect and not, uh, without any effect of uh, uh, prenatal nutrition. All those animals from, uh, in this study, we investigated the three extreme groups, the high, high, low, low, and mid high. All those groups were able to produce uh, an late surge in response to exogenous estradiol. And again, we can see that the area under the curve, the magnitude and duration and timing of the late surge was not impacted by prenatal nutrition. So in conclusion to this study, again, we see that exogenous estradiol suppress uh, concentrations of FLH as one would expect, but prenatal nutrition uh, did not impact frequency, amplitude, or concentrations of FLH and FSH in those animals. Neither uh, it, did, it impacted uh, the negative or positive feedback responsiveness to estradiol, which again is primarily in rumens being clearly demonstrated to be mediated uh, particularly by those neurons in the arcan nucleus, those candy neurons in the arcan nucleus uh, that co-express kispeptin in their kind of being and then And again, it's important to emphasize that this is in contrast to a large part of the literature that's been generated in rodents and even in the sheep, where show that uh, those levels of extreme nutrition during gestation can have some major impact on reproductive performance of the offspring. So clearly showing there's quite a bit of research in rodents showing impact on age of puberty, fertility, litter size, and so forth. But again, in cattle, it shows that uh, uh, the adult reproductive phenotype in these animals is quite resilient to significant degrees of nutritional, uh, ex nutritional stress imposed during the prenatal development, particularly if early gestations, the first trimester is avoided. So this suggests that again, uh, nutrition after weighing in postnatal nutrition uh, play a much more significant role programming the near endocrine axis and regulating age of puberty and other aspects of fertility of those animals than actually uh, nutrition during prenatal development. Okay, to summarize, uh, again, uh, I've shown some data that nutritional advancement of puberty is associated with key alterations in the neuroendocrine system of heifers. So we show that nutrition during early life uh, leads some major changes uh, in the hypothalamus, which are associated with increased tonic secretion of GnRH and LH and earlier puberty in those animals. And we show that the NPY, GnRH, and the POM6 peptin systems are likely involved in this nutritional acceleration of puberty in heifers with, again, increased leptin and increased adiposity stimulating and activating uh, or stimulating inputs of POMC on candy neurons and stimulating generated secretion, as well as suppressing uh, neuropeptide Y, which has inhibitory effects on, 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 on depolarization of generated neurons. The neuronal plasticity associated with this juvenile development, particularly between eight, uh, four and eight months of age, provides really a good opportunity for nutritionally modulating age of puberty. So from a translational standpoint, to animal production, uh, this data has been used to develop actually practical strategies that are uh, improving nutrition status of those animals early in life, again, by taking advantage of this window of opportunity for nutritionally uh, programming the development of the brain and having uh, developing that as a strategy to advance puberty. And finally, we've shown that adequate postnatal nutrition can overcome deficits programmed during late gestation in the bovine female, showing that nutrition after weaning uh, is able to overcome potential uh, detrimental effects caused by nutrition extremes. And it's important to emphasize that those are quite extremes during gestation of animals that were really thin or really obese during the last two trimesters of gestation. So clearly showing that as long as nutrition postnatally is adequate in those animals, it can basically overcome any deaths program during prenatal development. So with that, I would like to thank all, all, the, all the collaborators. So obviously all the cattle work has been done in collaboration with Dr. Gary Williams here at Texas A&M University. Obviously some of this data has been generated previously by Dr. Marcel Stalden and several collaborators. Uh, Vasanta Padmanabhan, a major collaborator in the SHIP model, uh, which I don't have much time or much chance to, to discuss that today. And finally, I'd like to thank the funding agents, particularly the, uh, the USDA for funding uh, this project on, on puberty development and metabolic regulation of puberty in cattle. Thank you. Well, thank you, Adolfo. Excellent overview of what's going on in uh, large animals. 
uh, I think one of the things that this points out um, is that we still have a $64,000 question of what the estradiol is doing in the in the hypothalamus to suppress and then activate uh, this whole system. And particularly during the suppression and how that suppression is overcome during puberty, during postpartum anestrus and so forth. Do you have any uh, comments associated with that? That's an excellent question. And, and I was just in West Virginia last week and I was visiting with Stan Heilman about it. And, uh, he obviously has done a lot of work on that in the ship and, 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 and Marcel had done quite a bit of work on that as well. And the idea, the initial idea is to be associated with maybe a regulation of uh, estrogen receptor alpha in the hypothalamus, particularly now that we know that candy neurons are a key target uh, for that work. But uh, uh, Michel Bidemba has done a really nice work uh, with Marcel and that was published in endocrinology a few years ago showing that during puberty development, there's no change in, in expression of ER alpha in those candy neurons, showing that this down regulation, this, this uh, desensitization of the system to those uh, estradiol inhibitory effects are not associated with any changes in, in the abundance of estrogen receptor alpha in those candy neurons. So, uh, so that's a really, really important question that we're addressing. And, and, and again, Stan Heilman at West Virginia University has some, some really cool model where he's looking also potentially upstream and some other neurons that could be involved on that regulation. Uh, so palm C neurons could be a direct target for, for estrogen effects. But uh, yeah, I think that's a really important question that we still don't completely understand how that escape from the estradiol negative feedback occurs in ruminants. So I don't see any other questions here just yet. So I'm gonna ask uh, one more uh, and that is, uh, where do you see the potential to regulate uh, this system most efficiently? Obviously you've been working on nutrition. Is there uh, something that we can do with uh, estradiol or estradiol antagonists? to regulate this that uh, might be more economical when regulating nutrition? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in developing pharmacological strategies to uh, advance puberty uh, in animals. And obviously, uh, one method, obviously, as we discussed, is through activation of some of those uh, neurons and metabolic pathways, but obviously, uh, we know that uh, estrogen and estrogen signaling is really, really important on this system. So uh, I think it was really nice that uh, Victor Navarro presented. And, and, and one thing I didn't mention is also the reciprocal connections between uh, candy neurons and, and palm C neurons. And obviously there's a lot of ideas that the system is not only important in regulating reproduction, but it could be a way by which steroid hormones regulate energy homeostasis, right? So I think there's some, some, some important uh, discussion there. And I think uh, definitely uh, some pharmacological strategies aiming at, for instance, uh, uh, the estrogen receptor alpha could be also developing, could be a good, good target for developing some strategies for to advance puberty. There's, well, a, there's a, on the uh, chat. a question. The question came up on chat that, uh, and I apologize because I uh, missed the name of the individual and I don't, uh, see it on here. It says, great talk. While the rodent data don't support a connection between alpha MSH and KISS-1 neurons in the POA, I'm wondering if you looked at the alpha MSH projections to KISS-1 neurons in the POA of your animals. Do you think alpha MSH projections are exclusive to the KISS-1 archaeot population? That's an excellent question. Really good question. Uh, the, the simple... Uh, the, 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 so first, we haven't looked at direct inputs of alpha message to the roster population of kispeptin neurons. But again, when we've done the study looking at projections of alpha message to GnRH neurons in the POA, we see very few projections to GnRH neurons there, but we also see an overall very few projections to the POA area overall. So there could be some target projections there to uh, the roster population of kispeptin. So obviously, in ruminants, uh, that population is a little bit more scattered 
throughout the POA rather than being more concentrated in the AVPV as we see in rodents. Uh, so definitely there could be some projections there, but again, just based on the fact that we see very little neuronal projections containing alpha MSH in the POA, I would assume that even though there might be some direct inputs towards those hispeptin neurons, I would assume that the number would be also very limited, similar to what we've seen for, for generation neurons. Okay, uh, Jennifer Hill uh, asks a question, and do you believe the different reproductive strategies of rodents versus ruminants, like the number and frequency of births, are reflected in species difference in the impact of maternal nutrition? Yeah, that's a very good question. It could be. It could be very, I mean, it, it, that would make a lot of sense, that the, the, the type of placenta, but again, important to emphasize that this difference that we see in this work is quite <laughs> drastic from the rodent work, but also quite different from the sheep work, where in the sheep work, this level of uterine restriction would cause some, some more drastic reproductive alterations in the offspring. Uh, so where does that resiliency from, from cattle to those nutrition extremes come from? That's a good question. Uh, uh, again, the, the, the hormonal profile, the changes in leptin and, and metabolic profile are quite drastic. Uh, one of the things we notice is with the, I haven't showed the leptin data in the, in the cows during the station, but what we notice is that overnutrition results in a major, uh, a major increase in concentrations of leptin. But when we look at the moderate group, our control group and the restricted animals, we see a very small, very modest reduction in concentrations of leptin. So in other words, increase at the positive of those cows led to a major increase in leptin, but a little bit different of the data I've seen in rodents is that nutrient restriction really didn't suppress much throughout most of the gestation, the circulating levels of leptin. So there could be, that could explain some of the mechanisms by which, again, uh, nutrient restriction doesn't cause a major uh, reproductive phenotype on those animals. Because again, in, in monogastric species and, and some other species, we, at least based on the data published, it seems like that that level of nutrient restriction will cause in a major reduction in, in circulating concentrations of leptin in, in, in the maternal level. But that's a really good question, yeah. So we haven't had any more come in here just yet. Let me ask uh, uh, one more. And that is, let me ask this from a kind of a production point of view. Uh, based on your data, uh, and, and there are two aspects to this question. One is the maternal aspect and the other is the fetal aspect. Uh, clearly from the fetal aspect, uh, your data show that uh, if you provide reasonably adequate nutrition starting at four to eight months of age in female calves, they're going to hit puberty and produce essentially normally. What about the, what if would happen if you restricted nutrition to the cows? Because obviously it's not going to have much of an impact on the calves and then try and catch those cows up. Uh, fairly rapidly after birth? Are they going to have a short postpartum period if you uh, essentially give them a high level of nutrition shortly after birth and restrict nutrition before birth, which could result in a large feed savings for the producer? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, Terry. I, I just would like to emphasize two points. Is we didn't see any effects on puberty in the offspring and we didn't see any effects on that first. So those are sexually mature heifers on that first cycle. But obviously for some of the models of insults during prenatal development, sometimes the reproductive phenotype is quite normal initially, but then my later in life, later adulthood, then manifestation of some of those reproductive alterations can be expressed. So I think it's important to emphasize here now, even though we didn't see any changes in puberty and, and several aspects of the reproductive phenotype after puberty, again, those are our young pubertal animals, right? So that doesn't necessarily mean that it couldn't have an impact on longevity or 
as again, as we see in the SHIP model of polycystic ovary syndrome that leads to reprodu uh, premature reproductive failure on those animals, right? So that's one important aspect to keep in mind is we, obviously that, that would require a really long study to completely characterize the reproductive phenotype. But again, back to your question, I think, you know, that certainly could be a strategy. Uh, but again, obviously the concern would be, again, the, the ability of those cows to reestablish cyclicity during the postpartum here, right? So there's a lot of debate what's more important if it is the body condition score of a cow when she has her calves or if it's nutrition during that postpartum period. And, and, and depending on the group, uh, we know that when the animal has her calf, she's going through the peak of lactation. So it's really hard to increase the paucity and, and reestablish body conditions for during the postpartum period. So that's, that would be my only concern if you use that as a strategy to save some costs in feeding if, uh, if after that uh, cow has her calf, if you actually would be able to increase nutrition to a level that would increase uh, body condition score adiposity in a way that that animal could actually reestablish cyclicity fairly quickly. But that's a really good question. Okay, I don't see any other questions coming in. It's uh, eight minutes after the hour now. So I want to thank you very much, Rodolfo, uh, for the excellent presentation. And Erica, do you have any uh, comments to finish us up on this webinar series? I think that's all. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Uh, remember, these will all be available online shortly for you to view. And be sure to check out registration for our upcoming series, which is the experimental methods and techniques in reproduction. Thank you both so much. And that will conclude our webinar for this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Terry. Uh, thanks, everybody.